Hello, everybody. Hopefully, you can all hear me. Thank you for that introduction. It, uh, it's always a pleasure for me to speak to the Vancouver Geotechnical Society, having lived in Vancouver some years back and uh, and actually being involved in VGS. And actually, I think I was chair of VGS at one time, a, a long time ago. Uh, so it's uh, I have a lot of friends there, and it's a group I'm familiar with. Um, I noticed first error on my slide, it says October. I think that was because I prepared the slides in October and I realize it's now November, so I, I'm a little bit off there. But the, the topic of my talk is um, evaluation of flow liquefaction and liquefied uh, strength using the CPT. And uh, I had um, done a paper in 2010 and I really wanted to sort of give an, a bit of an update to that method. Um, and uh, when we get there, you'll understand why. Um, okay. There we go. Um, so the outline is, um, I wanted to sort of pose uh, the structure of the talk as a series of questions. And uh, so here are the questions. Uh, uh, the first few, uh, hopefully review relatively quickly, what is flow or sometimes referred to as static liquefaction? And, 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 and that's related to a, a strength loss. And so what's the cause of that strength loss? And then why can SANS experience this sudden undrained strength loss? And then what can trigger it? And then leading into the update, which is how do we evaluate the, uh, the potential of strength loss? And then I also want to talk a little bit about what's the risk of instability and, uh, and then lead to a summary. So first, what is uh, flow? Uh, as I say, sometimes referred to as static liquefaction. As many of you know, I prefer the term flow liquefaction because sometimes earthquakes can trigger it. And so the term static liquefaction can be a little bit misleading. Uh, but they're often interchangeable. And uh, what it is, it, it's a sudden and significant strength loss resulting in a flow failure. And of course, major examples, one of the oldest ones is actually the, the famous Risa landslide in Norway back in 1978, which was a quick clay landslide and it was caught on, uh, on camera at that time. So there is a, a YouTube video, you can go and look at it and you can see the similarities even though it's a quick clay. And then, of course, there have been several tailings dam failures. One of the earliest big ones was the Stava tailings dam in Italy in 1984. And then more recently, there was the Fundao tailings dam in Brazil in 2015. And then the Fijon tailings dam uh, also in Brazil in 2019. And I was involved in the Fajal Tailings Dam investigation. And I, I'm not going to show the video. Um, sometimes it's difficult to get the video to work. Um, so I've just taken some screenshots. So here's the, the view from across the valley, looking directly at the Tailings Dam. It's about 80 meters high. And the date is in the top right-hand corner. You can see the, the time. Um, it was around midday, 12.28 and 22 seconds. Uh, the investigation report, the website is there if you want to read it. I'll just show a couple of, a couple of still images. The first one is, um, you know, when, okay, hopefully the first one when it goes, there. Um, and you can see the, the toe begins to bulge out and the crest uh, drops quite suddenly. Um, and um, it, it, it's, a, it's a large um, simultaneous slide, you know, almost the full width of the dam. And then within a few seconds, it bulges more, drops rapidly, and then begins to move out. All of that occurring in about 10 seconds. So uh, a major failure occurring in a, in a period of, of literally less than 10 seconds. And then you can see that as it begins to move out, it, it's lost a lot of its strength, and it's beginning to move very rapidly with a very large destructive force. If you were to continue to watch the video, you see that... Um, there's this initial slide that starts at the crest and comes out at the toe. And uh, it's followed by a series of slides that retrogress back into the tailings dam. And uh, if you read the report, there was also a camera at the rear of the tailings dam looking across the pond and you see the crest drop. And then afterwards, there's a series of, of subsequent slides that occur quite rapidly, typically about every five to 10 seconds, uh, a slice would drop off and then it would move out. And if you watch the rear video all the way to the end, uh, you can see that most of the tailings are gone within about a period of five minutes. And the last uh, video images show that the tailings is, is essentially behaving like a liquid. You can see it splashing as it moves out. And uh, so really quite a catastrophic failure 
uh, resulting in a significant number of deaths. So if we look at the case histories in general, uh, you know, I, I show an image here of the Stava tailings dam failure in Italy, black and white uh, satellite image, and then the Fundao image uh, from Brazil. And the common features of all of these failures is the deposits are very young in, in geologic age, and of course the tailings deposits uh, almost by definition are very young compared to most natural deposits. They're mostly non-plastic or low plastic materials, and there's little or no stress history. They're young uh, uh, and they're uncemented, and they have very, very little stress history. And they're very loose, so they're, they're contractive at large strains. And also the, the effective stress on the initial failure mechanism and even the subsequent uh, regressive failures, they're all uh, low effective stress, generally less than two atmospheres with just one or two that possibly were as high as three atmospheres, so generally very low effective stress. Common instability features is the triggers uh, are, are, are minor often, so the, these instabilities are caused by very minor disturbances. Failures tend to occur without warning, they tend to be very rapid and progressive as I illustrated in those still images from the video of Fajon. And also that because they're so rapid and they often occur without warning, is the observational approach doesn't always apply because you don't have any time to, to respond. You know, if the failure takes 10 seconds or so, you don't really have any time to respond. So of course, it's a major design issue for tailings dams. So much of what I'm gonna say is often focused towards tailings dam. And that's why this group is often a good group to talk to because a lot of uh, major geotechnical consulting firms that work in the mine uh, tailings industry are, are centered in Vancouver. So you're a very knowledgeable group of geotechnical engineers. So if we talk about undrained shear and, and undrained strength, you know, you, you had your short course by Mike Jeffries and Dawn Shuttle, and they talked about the whole critical state framework. And so uh, I'm going to show critical state line. And here's an example that they show, you know, the, the concept of plotting void ratio against the log of mean effective stress. And the critical state line is represented here as a straight line. And uh, soils can uh, exist on either side of it. They can either be on the loose side where they are going to be contractive as they move towards critical state or they can be on the dense side where they tend to be dilative and move towards critical state. So if you look at a sample that's on the loose side and it has a state parameter that I'll define in a moment, if it's loaded drained, that means it would contract towards critical state. But if it's loaded in an undrained manner, then there's no um, volume change, there's no void ratio change. So that contraction, that tendency to contract creates a buildup of pore pressure and so the buildup of pore pressure decreases the effective stress and the effective stress path moves horizontally towards critical state. And on the right hand side, I've got a sort of simplistic strength envelope diagram where you've got an initial state. The drain strength would, of course, go straight up to the, uh, the strength envelope. Uh, but if it's loaded undrained, you, you build pore pressure and the stress path curves over towards critical state and you have an undrained strength. Uh, at critical state. And so for contractive soils, the, the undrained strength ratio is less than the tangent of the friction angle. You know, the tangent of the friction angle is that ratio of the drain strength to the initial uh, vertical effective stress. And the undrained strength ratio is that final undrained strength ratio to the vertical effective stress. But of course, it's critical, it's sensitive to the slope of the critical state line. So if the critical state line is flatter, everything else being kept the same, it's got a lot further to go. Even though the, the, the tendency for contraction is the same, to get to critical state, it has to travel a lot further. So it develops a lot more pore pressure, which means the defective stress decreases more. So it goes further down the strength envelope and you, have the, you can have these potentially very low liquefied undrained strengths. And of course, uh, because of the curvature of the, the critical state envelope, it, it actually could get to essentially zero. Um, so for very loose soils, they show strain softening response in undrained shear. So large buildup in, in pore pressure. So this concept of our soils contractive or dilative is fundamental to critical state soil mechanics and it's useful to, to understand. And of course, Bean and Jeffries um, took that and, and uh, you know, sort of promoted the idea of the state parameter, which is a very powerful concept, which says you can define the state of a sand 
not by its void ratio or relative density, but by the void ratio relative to critical state, and they defined a state parameter. And what I'm suggesting is that uh, it's possible that the, the ratio of the stresses, so the, the mean effective stress that you start with to the mean effective stress at critical state, that ratio um, is in some respects slightly a better way to capture undrained strength loss because it's, it's a direct measure of the undrained strength loss as opposed to the indirect way of state parameter that's got to be linked to the slope of the critical state line. There is a relationship between the two and, and Bean and Jeffries talk about that in, in their book and they quite often show plots not just of state parameter but the ratio of state parameter divided by the slope. And in a way that the, 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 the ratio is uh, for sand is analogous to the ratio of OCR for clay. So they're, they're very analogous. Uh, OCR, of course, is a, a ratio of stress uh, linked to the normal consolidation line, where this is a ratio of stress linked to the critical state line. But for clays, the two tend to be parallel, so there, there is a, a similarity between the two. Now, uh, Jeffries and Bean in their book showed a lot of examples of of critical state line. Here I've, I've taken a few of them just to illustrate. The only difference I've done is I, instead of plotting it against void ratio, I've plotted against relative density. So for these sands, they gave Emax and Emin values. So you could calculate the relative density. You see the family of them. And uh, Jeffries and Bean tended to you know, uh, assume a linear critical state line, and they were looking at a relatively limited stress range. So that was a reasonable assumption. But by sticking to relative density, I can then show what the critical state line of a number of sands looked like if you were to test them out to much higher stresses. Now, the horizontal scale is mean effective stress normalized by atmospheric pressure. So one is 100 kPa, and of course, 10 uh, is 1,000 kPa. Um, but a lot of tailing stands are now getting up to these higher stresses. So more and more tailing stands are out at these higher stresses. So the curvature becomes quite important. The other nice thing about using relative density as your, as your plotting uh, routine is that uh, Bolton, of course, had his simplified stress dilatancy relationship, where a lot of people use it to um, estimate the dilatancy, which is they use it to then estimate friction angle. But if you put the dilatancy uh, relationship to, um, to zero, you can use Bolton's relationship to actually draw the critical state line. And so here's, here's the dashed lines are Bolton's relationship with his um, um, grain characteristic parameter Q, and he recommends a value of 10 for silica sands, and then values that are progressively smaller as, as the, the grain mineralogy is, is more crushable. And so uh, here's Toyora sand, which is a silica sand. It actually matches Bolton's curve quite well. And here's an example of a silty sand that sort of matches Bolton's curve for a Q value of, of seven. So it illustrates that the curvature is quite important uh, and that Bolton's relationship is quite a nice framework to look at that. And it's not surprising that Bolton's uh, uh, approach agrees with the data because after all, his was an empirical approach based on a lot of lab data. So hence it, it is matching it. Now, if I take an example in the Jeffries and Bean book, they, they showed a lot of examples, but the Urksac sand was quite extensive. They did a lot of testing on this sand. So you really have a, a picture of how the sand behaves at a very wide range of, of uh, void ratios and stress levels. And because of that, you could essentially draw a limiting compression curve and said, well, they were unable to ever get uh, Urksac sand to ever go beyond that loosest consolidation state. And this limiting compression curve, this is a feature that's in the um, MIT um, uh, constitutive model of this uh, eventually getting to a, a limiting uh, compression curve that's essentially parallel to the critical state line. And sure enough, at Urksac sand, you can see that's happening. And I've shown a couple of example consolidation lines where a very loose sand, of course, would almost follow that loosest state. And then a denser sand would be initially uh, dilative. But as you uh, consolidate it to higher and higher stresses, eventually it crosses the critical state. It becomes more contractive and then eventually curves over and goes down the limiting uh, compression curve. And so even dense sands at high uh, overburden pressures will eventually become contractive at large strains. Now, 
because I had a lot of data, you could I, I picked out sort of three examples, uh, test A, B, and C. A is at a, um, a very loose um, void ratio, a relative density of around uh, 10% and a relatively low confining pressure. I know it's 10 atmospheres, but they, they had other tests at one, two, and three at atmospheres. Um, and so sample A, when tested, showed a significant strength loss and it had an undrained strength ratio at critical state of as low as 0.01, so almost zero due to that curvature. And so the brittleness uh, was, uh, or, or or uh, let me define it here. Bishop defined the brittleness index in 67. I actually prefer to call it a strength loss index because that's exactly what it is. It's the uh, amount of loss of strength relative to the peak strength. So if the strength loss index is one or 100%, then you've lost all the strength. And if it's zero, you've lost no strength. And so sample A lost 90% of its strength. Sample B, which actually has a larger state parameter, but you can see travels a shorter distance to get to critical state, um, has a slightly higher undrained strength ratio at critical state and only loses 40% of its strength. And then sample C, which is consolidated to quite a high over, uh, effective overburden pressure. And even some denser sands would have got to state C eventually. But this has an undrained strength ratio of 0.2 and only a 20% strength loss. And so uh, that sort of really indicates that the curvature of the critical state line is important when you're covering a wide stress range. And really the most critical area is the very loose materials at low confining pressure, where the distance, the horizontal distance, that stress ratio between its current stress state and its stress state at critical state, can be a very large distance across there. So that ratio can be a large number with significant strength loss. Whereas when you get to high effective overburden, yes, the materials are contractive, but they're not so, um, they, don't, they have less strength loss potential. And this is reflected in this uh, diagram that uh, Sato Karimi and Olson put together. There's also a similar plot in the Jeffries and Bean book. They plotted in terms of state parameter divided by the slope, um, but there's a little bit more scatter when you choose that, mainly because of the uncertainty of selecting the appropriate slope. But Sato Karimi and Olson chose to, to use this stress ratio, and you can see the data's tighter fit. And uh, you can see it, it's, this relationship is independent of how the sample was made. It was independent of the, of the initial fabric and the direction of loading. And here's these three samples from ERSAC as an illustration. And I show as a reference, normally consolidated clays typically have a ratio of around three or four. So they're down here. So normally consolidated clays usually have maybe 10, 20% of strength loss index or sometimes no strength loss at all. So you can see the relationship drops quite vertically here. So what can cause sands to experience this sudden strength loss and behave undrained? Traditionally, most textbooks talk about whether or not you have slow drained loading or rapid undrained loading. And many people still tend to think that way of that, well, this will only happen if I have a, a rapid undrained loading. But really it boils down to the rate of volume change. So if the materials are loose and they're contractive, and if sheared, they will have a tendency to contract. And if that contraction occurs rapidly and the pore water does not have time to drain, and that's a function of drainage path. So if all the elements around it are also suffering contraction, and so it's not just a matter of the pore water having to drain a very short distance, but having to drain a long distance to where there's a, a clear drainage path, which for tailing dams, we now could be talking 10, maybe 20 meters drainage path. So the, the, the rate of volume contraction could in fact be relatively slow, but it's a very slow process for that water to get out. And so it can switch to undrained shearing, even though the loading could be quite um, slow. So it's not controlled so much by the rate of loading, but actually by the rate of volume change. And that means that slow drained loading, for example, a rising groundwater level, can trigger sudden undrained response. And a graduate student, we had a graduate student in, at the U of A when I was there, 
of Sassitharan, and we had a publication in the mid-1990s uh, in the Canadian Geotechnical Journal where we illustrated that point. We had samples of loose sand, and we kept the shear stress roughly constant, so Q was roughly constant, and the mean effective stress was decreased slowly with the drainage valve open, and then it reached the yield envelope, and then suddenly there was a large volume contraction that triggered it to go undrained with a significant strength loss. We then followed that up with more research where we actually tested um, dry samples and showed that yes, once it hit the yield surface, there was sudden volume contraction for it to move to critical state. And so what can trigger strength loss? And essentially it's any shearing that can induce this contractive behavior. And uh, Olsen and Stark had this rather nice simplified diagram. It shows the stress drain curve on the left and the stress path on the right. And it sort of shows uh, three main ones, the, the, the traditional rapid undrained loading, such as rapid construction, which is stress path A rising up to B and then strain softening down to critical state at C. Or um, you can have an earthquake. Here is A prime. The earthquake occurs. And the earthquake could be quite small just to induce a little bit of pore pressure. And then, of course, when it hits yield, um, it then causes strength, uh, strain softening, and it goes to critical state. And also, there's the stress path of like an increase in groundwater level, which is A to D. So the shear stress remains approximately constant, and the uh, either mean effective stress or the vertical effective stress is decreasing, and when it hits yield, it then triggers undrained collapse. So A to D could occur slowly in a drained manner, and then at D, it hits the yield envelope, and then uh, volumetric contraction occurs rapidly, and, and then it switches to undrained and goes to critical state. Uh, so the warning is that there, there are many different stress paths, uh, but the thing that's in common is the stress paths all approach the critical state with generally a decreasing uh, mean effective stress. So what are the conditions for flow liquefaction to actually create instability? And you actually have to have a number of things happen. One is, of course, you have to have this loose or saturated or near saturated soils that are contractive at large strains and, and are strain softening. Not all, as, as I said before, not all contractive soils are strain softening. So it's that combination of saturated or near saturated contractive and strain softening at large strains. And then, of course, you have to have relatively high shear stresses, higher than the, uh, the static, um, sorry, higher than the liquefied undrained strength. And then you have to have some event or, or a series of events that can trigger the strength loss. Um, and then uh, a sufficient volume of this loose material to actually cause instability. Like you may have a dam uh, that may be a well-constructed, compacted earth embankment, and the tailings behind it, a portion of the tailings might be very loose and contracted and saturated, and they may show some strength loss. But if the dam is strong and it's dilative and it's drained, and so it has a high drain strength, then although there is strength loss in a small portion, instability may not result. And then, of course, the last thing is you have to have a geometry that enables the instability, such as a, a slope, as I've illustrated here. So how do we evaluate uh, the, the susceptibility to this strength loss? And um, since a lot of uh, tailings are non-plastic or low plastic, then in-situ testing is often preferred. And of course, um, you know, the CPT and the seismic CPT with pore pressure measurements is often the preferred method because it, it's rapid, cost-effective, gives you continuous data, it's very repeatable. And now there's extensive experience with case histories. So we have a lot of knowledge of how how to apply it. Uh, so it's those combinations of things that tend to make the CPT uh, very attractive for large tailings dams. Um, and so with the CPT, we can estimate if the soils are contractive, and we'll discuss that in a moment. Uh, and then, of course, you, you've also got pore pressure measurements, so you can determine the piezometric profile, and you can do dissipation tests to determine the drainage conditions during the CPT, whether or not it's drained or fully undrained or even partially drained. And of course, because you can uh, do lots of CPTs, uh, you can evaluate the variability of the contractive soils, both vertically and laterally, and you get literally thousands of data points, so you can actually run statistical evaluation on the, uh, the variability. 
And also you can estimate whether or not there's any microstructure such as aging or cementation by combining the shear wave velocity with the CPT. We don't have time to discuss that here, but I, I'm sure many of you uh, have read the 2016 paper where I did discuss it and, and how to do that. And then of course, follow it up with uh, selective sampling in the critical layers. And uh, you'll see later that when we're talking about fine grain tailings that are essentially clay-like, it's important to take lots of in-situ water contents because if you have a saturated clay-like tailings, in-situ water contents become a very valuable way of estimating the in-situ uh, void ratio. So don't underestimate how important it is to take uh, frequent high-quality in-situ water content. And then of course run index testing to determine how variable the material is and how plastic it is. And then also investigate the mineralogy to determine whether or not the mineralogy is unusual and therefore may be affecting the CPT interpretation. And then of course do reconstituted testing to determine the critical state line and also determine um, how curved that critical state line is in the stress range that you're interested in. So there's a number of CPT based methods around, you know, driven to basically evaluating whether or not the materials are contractive, either, either evaluating the state parameter directly or indirectly just determining whether or not it's contractive or not, or in the case of Olsen and Stark going straight to the liquefied undrained strength. So Howard Pluis with Mike Jeffries and Mike Davis, I think were the, were the first to, to do this. And then Olsen and Stark had their method and Sadra Karimi has given some updates. Uh, Jeffries and Bean in their books, of books, you know, the early one and then the second edition have gone into it in extensive detail. And then I discussed it in 2010. And of course, it's mostly sand-like data uh, where the CPT is predominantly drained during the penetration process. And uh, there's different normalizations, which uh, is why you often can't compare them directly. Um, uh, since there's a strong likelihood that Howard uh, is in the audience, I think it's nice to, to reflect upon that first approach. And, and Howard was really the first one to suggest that you could put contours of state parameter onto a soil behavior type chart. Here it's normalized cone resistance against friction ratio, and he's drawn a, a couple of uh, contours. And the red line is, is sort of that boundary, which is roughly that minus 0.05. Um, state parameter that Bean and Jeffries had suggested. So all values above that would be uh, dilative and all values below it would be contractive. And Howard made a sort of a simplified assumption that said that the friction ratio was sort of an index of the um, slope of the critical state line. So they could use the Bean and Jeffries approach to, to uh, draw those lines, which was an excellent uh, first go at it. You see, I, I've ha always had a little bit of a question about the shape of the curve that Intuitively, you would expect it to curve over uh, at low, very low friction ratio when you're in clean sands. Uh, the normalization then uh, was based on mean effective stress, which was a, a, made life a little complicated. You have to make an, uh, an, an estimate of K naught. And also, uh, it cleverly included pore pressure. So it was one minus BQ, and BQ was the uh, excess pore pressure divided by the net cone resistance. The problem with that, though, is that when you're in um, sensitive clay-like soil, so you're in the bottom portion of the curve here, BQ can be very large and it can approach one, which means this normalization goes to zero. Um, and so the updated version that Bean and Jeffries has actually has a plus one added to it to counter that. And when the plus one is added, it essentially is, it's the effective cone resistance divided by um, either mean normal stress or, or the vertical effect of stress with a, a K naught assumption. And then in, in 2010, what I did is I, I looked at the case histories and uh, there were you know about 36 um, case histories, a little bit more now. Um, and I specifically honed in on the six that had high quality CPT data. And so I called these class A case histories. And of course it was the Nurler, Jamuna Bridge, Fraser River Sand at the Delta, Sullivan Mines. Uh, there was a, a site in Northern California, which was a sensitive silty clay, and then the lower San Fernando Dam, which we focused in on the silt. And what I did is I showed the data, typically the mean plus or minus one standard deviation. That's why instead of a single data point, it's an it's a oblong zone of data. And you can see that all the data plots within that region, very similar to the region um, that uh, Howard had shown on his chart. And I had suggested that uh, in the world of cyclic liquefaction, 
um, people are used to using a clean sand equivalent, and the clean sand equivalent of seven, 70 did in fact capture roughly that boundary and was in fact very close to that a boundary that represented the state parameter of about minus 0.05. So all based on case histories, um, consistent with uh, what, what Howard has suggested some years before. And of course, recently, most of you are aware that I sort of updated the soil behavior type charts uh, to use more of that behavioral type description now, recognizing that we call them soil behavior type charts because it's not exactly the same as the traditional soil classification. So now it has terms like sand-like and dilative, sand-like and contractive, and clay-like dilative and clay-like contractive. And so it has this boundary that's roughly, you know, that clean sand equivalent of 70, except I curved it over in the clay region to capture that you can have um, clays that the over-consolidation ratio of about four or five is the boundary between um, dilative and contractive. And so that's what that curve is at, at the end point there. And this chart is for soils with uh, little or no microstructure, so essentially young, unbonded soils. And it's important to note that in the sand-like region, that's where the CPT penetration process is primarily drained, so there are no excess pore pressures during penetration. And in the clay-like region, the CPT is typically undrained during penetration, so you get excess pore pressures. So for clay-like and contractive, and clay-like contractive sensitive, you can get quite large excess pore pressures, whereas in the clay-like dilative region, often it's a negative pore pressure due to the dilatancy. And that transition zone is roughly an IC of about 2.6 to 2.3, and that's where it transitions from a drain penetration to the undrained. So it can be a little bit mixed in here. Sometimes it can be pretty essentially drained, and sometimes it can be getting a, a beginning to get into the undrained area, but often it's sort of partially drained. And for many cases, given that the normalized cone resistance is quite large, it's actually closer to being drained, but there is a little bit of excess pore pressure. And so here's the case histories here. I'm just illustrating those same um, uh, class A case histories and now plotted over. You can see where they plot and, the, and of course they plot under the boundary of that CD equal to 70. And um, in the 2010 paper, I then uh, took it one more step and said, okay, what if we looked at the liquefied undrained strength ratios of the case histories? And here I'm plotting the, the class A's, I've numbered them, and the other ones are the class B. And I drew a boundary, and uh, I think Jeffries and Bean were quite right to sort of say, well, it's sort of a little bit, <laughs> anyway, typical of me, I tended to draw it by hand. And they said, no, you know, if, if, if you take a more mechanistic approach, it should be a, an exponential relationship. Uh, but in the paper, right at the end of the paper, I had said that this is primarily for sand-like soils, uh, but for when you get into clay-like soils, the relationship could be a little bit uh, conservatively low when you get into sensitive clays, where the remolded shear strength is better defined uh, by the sleeve friction divided by the vertical effective stress. And this was recognizing that when you get into clay-like soils, now that the cone process cone penetration process is undrained, and so we can actually use the sleeve friction as a direct measure of the large drain undrained strength. Whereas in sands, the process was drained, and so we can't directly get undrained strength, so we have to go via an intermediate parameter, which is the state parameter. So in sandy soils, we use state parameter as an intermediary, whereas in clays, we actually can go directly to it. Now, you can still use state parameter in clay-like soils, except that the, the, the ability to estimate state parameter in clay-like soils when the penetration process is undrained becomes less reliable. And so let's look at that. And so on the left-hand side here, I saw the updated soil behavior type chart. And we know from you know, 50 years worth of experience with CPT that the, the sleeve friction is approximately equal to the remolded undrained strength of a clay. And so the undrained strength ratio, which is the sleeve friction divided by the vertical effective stress, can be, can be simplified to just the friction ratio times the normalized cone, cone resistance divided by 100. Now, it says QTN, but keep in mind that when you're in the clay region, the stress exponent is one, and so QT becomes the same as the original Roth one, which is the same as the, 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 the Jeffries and Bean one. 
So it's the friction ratio, normalized cone resistance divided by 100. So they're actually diagonal lines. So of course, when friction ratio is 10 and the normalized cone resistance is one, so 10 times one divided by 100, it's 0.1. And so there, there's the contour of um, the undrained, the residual undrained strength ratio of 0.1. Here's 0.25, and you can see the arrow that says increasing sensitivity moves you more to the left, which is why this sensitive zone is identified to the left, and increasing OCR moves you vertically up. And so the, the chart on the right says that if you took the previous approach based on clean sand equivalent, which is linking to state parameter, you get these contours. And then in the clay-like region, you've got the other contours based on cleave friction. And there's a bit of a mismatch in the um, transition zone. They don't quite match up. Um, but they don't match up if you continue to use the traditional clean sand equivalent. So I realized that there was a need to make a small change to get it to match up a little bit better. And so that led me to, uh, the, the way to approach calculating the clean sand equivalent was with this correction factor, which is a function of the CPTIC. And so what I found is that when IC starts to approach 2.6, I needed to modify it a little bit so I could just draw the curves down a little bit more so they would match up uh, with the point when the CPT is fully undrained. So here I've identified, here's that IC of about 2.5 saying it's, it's generally drained uh, up to that point and then past that it becomes partially drained and past an IC of, of about three, it's typically undrained. And so I've made a small modification to the original one to just uh, increase KC to, to bend the curves over a little bit, and here's the simplified relationship. So when you do that, uh, I, I also um, uh, updated the link to the um, liquefied undrained strength ratio. So uh, the, the original relationship in 2010 only extended to 0.3 of an undrained strength ratio. If you wanted to extend it further, it didn't work. The, the relationship had a bit of a glitch in it, and that was why it was only, only ever shown to 0.3. Um, and so it sh it, that's shown in the blue dashed line. And so uh, following the Jeffries and Bean approach, I, 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 I've simplified it, made it a simplified sort of exponential relationship and extended it all the way up so that now you can begin to see that when, you've, when you get into materials that are now more dilative, that you begin to get into the situation where the drain strength will control. And so here's a series of lines based on the tangent of the friction angle and uh, for different constant volume friction angles. So at these high clean sand equivalents, so when you're in the dilative region, the, the drain strength uh, will control. And at very low values, the, the liquefied undrained strength fits the case histories. And I put the limit here and said, so when IC is less than three and the vertical effective stress is less than 300 kPa, you can use that relationship. And here's the traditional divider of 70. And it says, well, from 70 to 80, it's sort of, that's when you're in this partial contraction. So it's not fully contractive. So it initially contracts, but then begins to dilate as it moves towards critical state. Critical state is still on the contractive side, you know, that, that at the, by the time you get to critical state, it's still essentially contractive, but it was dilating uh, as it was moving towards it near the end. So you, you've got that. Uh, those stress paths that sort of contract over and then they bend and, and dilate up towards critical state. And so uh, here, if, if you look at the case history, so I've, I've shown a, a range for the liquefied undrained strength illustrating that there is some uncertainty there. And then I've also added in um, the uh, peak or the yield undrained strength ratio that Olson and Stark talk about in their paper in 2003. So I took their yield undrained strength ratios and applied the uh, the updated clean sand equivalent for the same case histories. And that's those little dots you see. And you can see there's quite a bit of scatter. So I put a cautionary note, it's the approximate relationship for the peak undrained str strength ratio. There's a lot of factors. This is for soils with little or no microstructure. Part of the variation is due to the um, type of loading, whether you know the direction of loading, whether or not it's compression, simple shear, or, or extension. And also the anisotropic stress state influences the peak undrained strength. So hence you can see um, uh, quite a bit of uncertainty there. And then to finish it off, 
uh, the complete diagram, it says, okay, so everything I showed there was for IC less than three, so in the sand-like region and capturing the transition zone with a modified clean sand equivalent. But then when IC gets greater than three, and the assumption is that the CPT penetration is now undrained, and you usually have pore pressure to confirm whether or not that's true, and then you can estimate the liquefied or the remolded undrained strength ratio from the, the sleeve friction. So that captures the updated approach there. Now, if you follow that all the way through, this is what you get. You get contours of um, liquefied or remolded undrained strength. So if in the sand-like region, it's based on clean sand equivalent with the link to state parameter. And then there's this transition uh, zone where there could be partial drainage. And then when you get into the undrained uh, CPT uh, zone where the CPT penetration is undrained, then it switches to the more clay-like behavior where you can directly estimate uh, the large strain, undrained strength from the sleeve friction and you get these diagonal lines and they, and they tie up and there's the boundary of about an IC of 0.3 to, to illustrate it. Um, so this diagram becomes quite a nice way to visualize it and you can plot your data directly over the top to see where it fits. So if you do that, but before I do that, um, if you look at the case histories, and, and this is uh, like the undrained strength ratio against that strength loss index, and since the undrained strength ratio of most of the case histories was on average around 0.1 plus or minus uh, somewhat, uh, roughly plus or minus uh, 0.05, and so the case history data fits there. So if you plot it over the top of that, that implies that the strength loss index was generally greater than uh, 40%. Um, so relatively high strength loss index. I know it says high brittleness there, but uh, that's a holdover from the previous term. So if we recognize that, that uh, it's mostly the high strength loss index is when the liquefied undrained strength is less than 0.15. So if I now draw the contour of 0.15 in there and say, well, the shaded area, that's going to be the most dangerous area because that's where uh, the largest strength loss potential exists. Uh, at least for uh, young uncemented uh, soils. And so if you look at the case histories, here's those case A, and, and you see they all tend to fit in that region. And then if I add the more recent ones, so here's the Fundal tailings down from the Morgenstern et al. Uh, expert panel report. It plots uh, up in the more sand-like region because they were looking at the coarse tailings as the driver. And then here's the Fejong, and here there were two different uh, tailings type. There was a coarse sand that plotted mostly up here in the sand-like region, contractive, and then the fine tailings that tended to plot down in the clay-like contractive. And in the fine tailings, yes, it was an undrained penetration, large excess pore pressures during the CPT um, with uh, T50 values of around um, 60 seconds, showing that it was an undrained penetration, and of course, some data that was in between as well. So if we talk about um, the evaluation of risk. How do we take all of that and determine what the what the risk level is? Now, this is a simplistic representation, but it, I find it quite instructive. And so, if you imagine a slope here, a relatively steep slope, let's assume it's all the same material, so it's some magic homogeneous soil, and there's a water table, and we're looking at an element of soil that's saturated below the water table. It's under the slope, so it has shear stresses on it, and because it's a relatively steep slope, it's got relatively high shear stresses on it. So if you look at the stress space of QP, you've got the strength envelope, the critical state strength envelope. There's a yield envelope linking to critical state, at least for the loosest one. And I've got a high initial stress state. And then on the right, I've got the stress drain curves again. And I've got three examples. I've got sample A, where there's no strength loss. So this material shows no strength at all no strength loss at all, so the strength loss index is zero. And if you were to do a limit equilibrium analysis um, based on that peak strength, you'd get a factor of safety of greater than one because, of course, the peak strength is larger than the, the driving stress. And then the, the second example, sample B, this is 20% strength loss, so it rises to a slightly lower peak and then loses 20% of its strength. And here you could see that if you would run uh, the stability analysis with the liquefied undrained strength, you would have got a factor of safety of roughly one because they're about equal. And then the third one is a, a soil that shows significant strength loss, 60% strength loss, or an IB of 
And if you run the stability analysis with the liquefied underage shred, you get a factor of safety significantly less than one. So the, the case of A would have been stable, B would have been marginally stable, relatively low risk. Uh, C would definitely be potentially unstable if it was triggered with a very high risk. And since the um, initial stress ratio is very close to yield, that means that it'll be a relatively small trigger that could trigger um, strength loss. You're very close to yield, so whether or not it's rapid loading or an increase um, in pore pressure or an earthquake that would build up a little bit of pore pressure, um, it wouldn't need to be very much to get you to hit yield and then to show strength loss. Now, if we show an example, uh, same sort of thing where you've got a slope that's not quite as steep, so now that the in-situ stress state is lower, um, and same three examples. So again, if there was no strength loss, of course, the factor of safety is high, probably greater than 1.5 in, in this example. And then if there's 20% strength loss, you're okay, because even though strength loss could occur, the factor of safety would still be greater than one. But if there's 60% strength loss, now the factor of safety uh, using the liquefied underage strength is, is less than one. So case A is stable, <coughs> case B is also stable, C is unstable, <laughs> um, with some risk. So the, the, there's still some risk associated with it. But now you can see that the stress state <coughs> is further away from yield. <coughs> Excuse me. So it will be harder to trigger it. The risk still exists, but clearly it's going to take a little bit more to, to trigger strength loss because you're further away from the yield surface. And then, of course, <coughs> if you make the slope even flatter or if there was a buttress constructed, so now the driving shear stress is much smaller. And so now you can see that all of them would be potentially stable because uh, the, the, the driving shear stresses would be so much lower. You'd be much further away from yield. And even if you trigger, did trigger, um, even if it was hit by a very large earthquake, uh, you wouldn't trigger any strength loss, or, or you, you may trigger some strength loss, but not enough to cause instability. Factor of safety would be greater than one. So that's an illustration of the of the sort of the, the generic framework. Now, if we introduce some other variables, so um, what we do know is that um, more highly plastic clays tend to be more ductile. Um, Ladd showed this in his Tursagi lecture when he talked about undrained strength of clays, and he showed that um, low plastic clays um, tend to rise to their peak uh, more rapidly and can, can show a sort of a, a, a more brittle response, whereas plastic clays tend to show a more ductile response. Now, now I am using the term brittle because brittleness brings not only the amount of strength, but the rate at which strength loss occurs. And you can see that uh, low plastic soils and non-plastic soils tend to show that strength loss quite rapidly at small strains, whereas highly plastic soils, uh, that strength loss occurs more slowly over larger strains. So if you had a more plastic material, it will be more ductile and stability may be more in terms of a slump as opposed to a flow. Now, if we go the other extreme, if you look at bonding or cementation, um, that tends to lead to a higher uh, peak strength. So actually the uh, now the, the peak strength can actually go outside of the critical uh, strength envelope because of the, the, the bonding will push it outside there. So peak friction angles can be higher than the critical state friction angle. And of course, a much smaller strain to peak. So the, the bonding is sticking the particles together. They don't want to move until they reach yield. And when they reach yield, the bonding breaks and then there can be um, rapid strength loss in a very brittle manner. So the the, the amount of strength loss can actually be higher for lightly bonded material, so there's a higher risk. So more plastic materials tend to be lower risk, um, uh, low plastic materials, higher risk, and of course, uh, lightly cemented materials or bonded materials can be higher risk. Now, let's talk a little bit about limit equilibrium because a lot of stability analysis is done using limit equilibrium analysis, and a lot of it is done using the peak undrained strength. And with limit equilibrium, the assumption is uh, in the limit equilibrium approach is that the material is rigid, perfectly plastic. So there's a single value of undrained strength for that element of soil. And so here I'm illustrating um, the, um, the, the red line is illustrating no strength loss. 
Um, so limit equilibrium actually works pretty well there. Um, there will be deformation, of course, prior to peak strength, but the assumption of rigid, perfectly plastic uh, works quite well, and experience shows that it, it works quite well, and uh, limit equilibrium has an excellent track record in those sorts of materials. But when you've got a material that shows a potential large strength loss, then you've got a potential failure surface, and some elements along the failure surface could be um, uh, straining where they, ha they haven't reached peak yet, but others have already exceeded peak and have already started to strain softening. So you could have regions that are overstressed and the average factor of safety can be misleading. So some areas could in fact already be strain softening and overstressed, even though the average factor of safety is greater than one. So limit equilibrium analysis based on peak undrained strength, when you've got materials that are susceptible to significant strength loss, can be misleading and, and you need to be aware uh, and to use caution. So when it comes to the risk of instability, you know, you then need to look at the consequences. So what's going to happen if instability occurs? So nowadays, of course, um, it's, it's more common to, to perform a breach analysis of a tailings dam to evaluate the consequences, both economic, environmental, and loss of life. And then if the consequence is high, so for example, possible loss of life, then it's prudent to assume that strength loss can be triggered at some time in the life of the structure. What I like to say, it's impossible to design with confidence against all possible triggers within the life of the structure. So for high-risk structures, if, there's, uh, if the material is susceptible to strength loss and the instability could result, then you must assume that strength loss could be triggered at some time. Now, if the consequences are low, then you might want to consider the de more detailed analysis, evaluating the risk, performing a sensitivity analysis, et cetera. Now, you know, those sort of simplistic approach I illustrated where all the materials was the same is obviously simplistic. When you've got a structure that's got um, a, a range of different materials, some of which are contractive, some are dilative. And so it's often nice to plot factor of safety against the uh, undrained strength ratio, both peak undrained strength ratio and liquefied unstrength ratio to get a sense of how sensitive the results are to the critical uh, areas and how sensitive your, uh, your decision making is to those parameters, given the uncertainty of those parameters. So, um, so if, if the consequence is high, then assume um, strength loss would be triggered at some time. Perform a limit equilibrium analysis using the liquefied or residual large strain undrained strength ratio, as we've discussed. If the factor of safety is, is greater than one, then obviously the risk of instability is low and generally acceptable. Um, it's becoming more common to put a small margin of safety in there, not just greater than one, but greater than 1.1. If the factor of safety is significantly less than one, then clearly the risk of instability is high. There's going to be significant strength loss, and you need to seriously consider remediating or changing the design. Now, if the factor of safety is close to one, you know, it might be less than one, but only just less than one, or greater than one, but only just greater than one. Obviously, the risk is smaller, but it still exists. You know, the strength loss is smaller, and if strength loss occurs, you know, the inertia forces are going to be smaller, uh, so they're not going to be quite so big inertia forces driving it, and so it may not um, evolve into a full flow. Um, and that's when it's sometimes suitable to carry out a risk assessment and a sensitivity analysis in more detail to e evaluate the actual risk. And then the next two points are just a reminder about low plastic soils tend to be more brittle at low stresses and undrained shear, and bonded or cemented soils tend to be more brittle due to the small strains to trigger strength loss. So summarizing the CPT uh, updated approach I've talked about, um, first of all, evaluate whether or not the soils have any significant microstructure, such as aging or cementation or unusual mineralogy that could be affecting uh, the interpretation. And the combination of CPT plus shear wave velocity is an initial way to evaluate that. But sometimes you need samples and, and to obviously look at the stress history, the depositional environment, if it's tailings, and then uh, look at the mineralogy and, and also think about uh, scanning electron microscope to look for evidence of possible bonding, et cetera.
and also investigate mineralogy in more detail. But if there is no significant microstructure, then evaluate whether or not the soils are contractive at large strains, and you can use that uh, updated soil behavior type, see if it plots below the contractive line. Um, and if, if it's sand like where IC is less than three, then use the modified clean sand equivalent you know, with that modified KC uh, relationship. Estimate the liquefied undrained strength ratio and apply that when the effective uh, overburden pressure is less than 300 kPa. If the overburden pressure is greater than 300 kPa, then it's useful to uh, add in some lab testing, evaluate the critical state line over a higher stress range to evaluate uh, the influence of curvature and how that may um, increase the values that you've estimated using the empirical approach based on case histories. Now, that, that I, I forgot to add, that, that empirical approach that I, I showed, if you actually go into the, um, the Jeffries and Bean book, of course, the beauty of the book is they lay out a, a detailed mechanistic approach based on critical state soil mechanics, and they add numerical modeling, and, and they, they show you how it can all be done. And at the very end of the book, you know, most of it has been based on lab data, calibration chamber results. Uh, and then at the end of the book, they begin to look at the case histories. And what you begin to find is that they have to adjust their relationship based on lab data and lower the, the relationships and say, well, the, the, the field values are lower than that. And so we're going to recommend that you use a lower relationship. And they, give, they end up giving you <clears throat> three relationships, each covering a sort of a range of the slope of the critical state line. Now, if you follow that logic through, and you know, compare it with the approach I've described, they're actually quite similar because what I did was similar to what Pluis did, which was say the CPT, the friction ratio, or in, in my case, the soil behavior type index I, IC, is, a, is an index of the compressibility. So it ends up being an index of the slope of the critical state line. So when you're in the transition zone and you're in the clay-like region, um, the IC is larger, the slope of the critical state, line is, is steeper, and so it's embedded in the correlation uh, automatically. Uh, but Bean and Jeffries uh, have a more sort of mechanistic way of, of incorporating, so it's useful to compare the two. And then if it's clay-like where IC is greater than three, and the, the CPT penetration is essentially undrained, and you've confirmed that with pore pressures, then uh, also estimate the, um, un, the residual undrained strength ratio using the, the sleeve friction, which can be simplified as the friction ratio times the normalized cone resistance divided by 100, which are those contours. Now, if the soils are dilative, then estimate the, the peak friction angle, and you can also do that based on the clean sand equivalent with a value of clean sand equivalent, which, which I illustrated in that diagram. So I know I covered quite a lot of ground there, uh, relatively rapidly. Um, the advantage of these online presentations, it's recorded, and so you do have the opportunity to go back and look at this again, and of course stop and, and go back and see if you, you caught what I said. Um, and of course, I, I think we're gonna have some time for questions, but to summarize then, flow liquefaction is a significant hazard, especially for tailings dams. Uh, a framework and methods have been developed. You know, A lot of it comes out of that work that Jeffries and Bean did, um, and I sort of uh, extended it a little bit. I, I've also discussed about uh, risk assessment associated with it and how to gain some understanding of that risk. And then, of course, uh, loose saturated or near saturated low PI soils at low effective confining stress in relatively steeper slopes tend to be more prone to instability for, for flow liquefaction. And so they are the ones you're, you're most cautious about. And of course, CPT and seismic CPT tend to be the preferred in situ tests to evaluate this behavior and, and then, of course, supported by laboratory testing uh, where appropriate. And then um, generally assume uh, strength loss will occur if the consequences of instability are high. Uh, so that concludes my presentation. Uh, I think there is going to be room for questions. So thank you for uh, your time and patience.